All right. This morning is kind of the grand finale of our series of having a clear vision. Since January, we've been talking about what does it look like for us to follow Jesus? Like, what is he asking us to be about? And so that, that's kind of been what we've talked about the, the last, what, eight, nine weeks, whatever it is now, uh, of what is the vision God has for us. And, and again, I, I've said this, but if you've missed any of them, they're all, all up on YouTube, and so feel free to go back and, and listen to any of those. But, but we started talking about fellowship first. That was kind of the, the God's called us Grace Fellowship Church. So the first thing we unpacked was the word fellowship based on kind of the benediction we say every week. So personally, I'll say this. I've never been in a church where fellowship was truly a priority. I, I was thinking this week, I grew up at a Methodist church in McKenzie, and I was there 18 years. And I'm telling you, I don't remember more than about two people's homes in that entire church, and I grew up there for 18 years. It's, fellowship was not a... Pro- now, we had fellowship meals, right? At, we call them Methodists. We call them added dish dinners, okay? So after church, we'll have an added dish dinner, and you all bring something. And so, and so that's, I, we had those a lot, but I, I didn't really understand what true fellowship was. And I started, as I've read the Bible, I've started looking at some of the things that God tells us to do. And I'm telling you this, we cannot do some of the things God tells us to do in Scripture without being in fellowship. Like, it requires us being together and not just coming here and listening to a sermon. So that's the first thing that we talked about in the series was, what is fellowship? And and we introduced kind of life groups. And I've said this, if you're not involved in a life group, we've got life groups for you. And that is truly, my prayer has been that those life groups will be the very fabric of our church. Not this. Not, this is a celebration. We come and we celebrate together what God's doing. My prayer is those life groups become the absolute priority of our church. Like if we need to get rid of stuff to make that a priority, we'll do it. But the, the fellowship of life groups will be the very fabric of who we are. And that we can't wait to be together week after week. That's been my prayer of what this fellowship's going to look like, because I think that's what Scripture teaches. They devoted themselves, not just when they felt like it, devoted themselves to, yes, breaking open the Word, but to fellowship, to prayer, to being together. And so if we're going to be about fellowship, that has to be a priority. It has to be a priority. So that's the first thing we kind of unpacked was this idea of life groups and fellowship. Number two, we talked about grace. Again, I encourage you to to check your heart about this daily, because you have been given grace upon grace, the Bible says. Like, you have been the recipient. If you're a believer in Christ, you've been the recipient of grace. Our job as believers and as a church is to be good grace givers, to dispense grace. And if that's going to be what God calls us to be, we've, we've got to be serious about this and, and, and check ourselves day after day. Are we good at dispensing grace? Because that's not a natural thing. The last two weeks, we focused on love, and that's where we're going to finish today, is talking about love. The world should, this is Jesus, this is not me, Jesus says, the world should know that you're a Christian based on your love. So what does that look like? What is the evidence that we actually are walking in love? Our title of our message is Walking in Love. Turn to Ephesians 5 if you want to. Or you can listen to me, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. That's going to be where we're starting today. We're going to be all over the Bible today, but I want to start in Ephesians 5. Here's what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Pray with me. God, thank you so much that as you tell us to walk in love, you show us what it looks like. God, I thank you that you're with us and we're not trying to do this on our own, God. But I pray that you would teach us what it looks like to walk in love this morning. As we look at your word and we look at the evidence that we're walking in love, I just pray we would examine our hearts and we would align our hearts to your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so walk in love. That's what what he says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk 
in love. I've, I've been asking God this week, God, I need you to show me exactly what this looks like so I can share it with this church. What does it look like, based on your word, to walk in love? Well, first off, I think, I think you've got to start here. God himself is love. We've said this over and over. You can't walk in something that you don't have. So to walk in love, to walk in this agape love, agape love is the love of God that necessitates a relationship with him, right? So if we're going to walk in love, it starts out, we've got to imitate God, but we've got to have God in us, right? So, what did God do because he loved us? We've said this from two weeks ago. He gave up Jesus. And we said agape love is a love of action, right? So, because of that, God loves us. It's not like, oh man, I just love Mark so much. I created him. I just love him. And he doesn't just tell you. He shows you by action. So, I'm going to do something. I'm going to give up Jesus. Now, the first thing you've got to understand, too, about that is agape love is a sacrificial love. Like it involves a sacrifice. Jesus was our sacrifice, but I'm telling you this because agape love is not a natural thing. Who wants to sacrifice anything? I mean, we want to keep what we have. We want to, you know? And so it's a sacrificial love, and so it's not going to be easy. As we talk about what it looks like to walk in love this morning, you need to hear this at the very beginning. It's not an easy walk. Because it does involve sacrifice. And it might make us uncomfortable. So the first thing in your handout, walking in love involves hospitality. Walking in love involves hospitality. Genesis 18, you can turn there if you want, but Genesis 18, there's a story we all, many of us know. There's this old man sitting at the opening of his tent, and it's in the heat of the day, the Bible says... His name is Abraham, Abram, okay? Abraham, let's say, okay? We know him by Abraham. So Abraham's sitting in his tent. It's the heat of the day. Do you know what just happened to Abraham, by the way? He's in pain. He just got circumcised, okay? So this old man is in pain. It's the heat of the day. And by the way, he's in the south of Israel. For those of you that have been there, it is hot, okay? And all of a sudden, there's three strangers, the Bible says, that's coming up. What does Abraham do? The Bible says he gets up and he runs to them. Now, what do you know about, we've talked about this in the prodigal, right? What about men running? That doesn't happen in their culture, right? It is shameful. You do not do... Abraham is not only hurting, it's not only the heat of the day, he's willing to shame himself on behalf of three strangers. Now, we know who those strangers are. He didn't. Like, we know those three strangers were were two angels and God, right? We, We know who they are. He didn't know that, and yet he still ran because of his compassion for them. Now, know that it says it's in the heat of the day. What does that mean? Is it 6 o'clock in the morning? 6 o'clock in the evening? No, it's more in the noontime, right? Now, why is it weird for three strangers to show up at noon? Well, in Israel, come with me this summer, the cities are spaced out a day's journey. So you leave one city in the morning and you get to the next city in the evening. You don't see strangers in the middle of the day unless something has gone wrong. That is weird, okay? So all of a sudden, Abraham sees these three strangers show up, and he sees them, and he runs to meet them. I was thinking about, I was probably in sixth grade or so. I remember one summer. I, how, would, how would you respond, first off, if you saw three strangers come into your home? How would you respond? I remember... Um, about sixth grade, it was summertime, and <laughs> this sounds so bad, but it was summertime in McKenzie, and uh, we had these huge windows on our dining room that we could see out in the front yard and the, and the road, and we saw this guy pedaling a bike, white shirt, black pants, right, and he's going door to door. You know what me and my mom did? 
we had a little galley kitchen, and we both got down like this right here so that they couldn't see us. We were real quiet, you know. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, we're exactly opposite of Abraham, right? I mean, we, that's like the exact opposite scenario of what Abraham's hurting, and all of a sudden he's running to strangers, and we're hiding from other people. So anyway, I, now what does he do when he gets to these people? Think about, think about what he does, too. He sees them, he gets to them. The first thing he does is wash their feet. Men don't do that in their culture. That, that's, that's, a, that's an odd thing. for It just shows you how much compassion and how much love he had for these three strangers that he didn't know. And then he tells his wife, Sarah, to go and what, what was she to do for them? Make bread. And if you, if you read the story, again, it's three sayas of the finest flour. That's wheat flour. You don't just eat wheat flour. You eat barley flour because it's a lot cheaper. Doesn't taste as good, though. But if you have special guests come over, let's get the fine, it's like the fine china out, right? So three sayas, how much is that? It's, a, it's 65 pounds of flour. It's enough bread to last six months, okay? So I want you to understand the great lengths Abraham's going to for three strangers that at this point he still has no idea who they are. That's called hospitality, that is someone who says, I love you this much, and I want to show you how much I love you. Now, we get to the New Testament. If you turn over to Hebrews chapter 13, here's what it says. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. Let love, okay, we're talking about love, of the brethren continue. Do not neglect, neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Do you know what that's talking about? talking about Abraham. Don't neglect, when you have three strangers coming up, you may not know who they are. He didn't. Don't neglect hospitality and showing them love, because you may be entertaining angels and not even know it. I think I teased this a few weeks ago, and I said something about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I said, maybe their sin was something different than than we've always thought. Because when I say Sodom and Gomorrah, my guess is you have some pretty wicked things that you're thinking about with Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know what the Bible says the reason was that God brought them down? It's found in Ezekiel 16. It says this, I gave you all these resources, Sodom. I gave you all. Listen, if you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, for those of you that have been with me to Israel, Sodom was where our hotel was for three nights or two nights when we were down in Israel, in the south part of Israel. Back in the time of the Bible, it was an oasis. Like it's in the middle of the desert, it's hot, yet it was full of life where Sodom was. That's why when Lot was like, where do I want to go? He pointed out Sodom. Why? Because it was full of life. It was an oasis back then. And so God had blessed Sodom with all these resources. And Ezekiel 16, 48 says, You didn't take care of the needy. You didn't take care of the other people around you. You didn't care after them, so down you go. Have you ever thought about that? Why did God, in Genesis 18, get rid of Sodom? And you think, oh man, because they were so immoral. There's no law yet. God hasn't given them the law. And you say, well, they weren't following God. Well, neither were all these other nations around them. God didn't come down and smite them. It was because they weren't showing hospitality. They weren't giving of what God had given them, right? And so, and so this is a huge thing for us. If we're going to be people that show agape love, we've got to understand hospitality. One day Jesus is t- telling a parable. It's Matthew 25. And he's talking about this king. And he says, there's this king who has sheep on his right, listen, and goats on his left. Okay, it's talking about judgment, okay? And he says to the sheep on his right, he says this. He says, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the beginning of the world. But here's what he says. For I was hungry, now listen, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. He says, I was a sojourner and you gave me a place to live. He says, I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, 
you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Now, if you're one of Jesus' followers, let's just say, you know what their question was? Wait a minute. When, when, when were you hungry, Jesus? I, I never saw that. When, when were you thirsty? When were you in prison? I don't remember that story. When, and you know what he, his reply was? What you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And it's a whole picture that he's giving us, saying, you want to show my love, what you do to the least of these, are you're doing that unto me. So you want to show my agape love, you want to be good love givers, you find those that are needy, who are in prison, who are hurt, you find those that need Jesus, and you show Jesus to them. Luke 14. Let me read this one. Luke 14. This, this one, verse 12, let's just get into it. And Jesus also went on to say to the one who had invited him, this is talking about the parable of the guests, here's what he says. When you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, otherwise they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed Since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, why does Jesus say, invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind? Why? why? Like, what what is the purpose behind that? He's reminding us of our mission. Like, we're here for a reason. Like, you were created for a reason. We were all created for a reason. And Our reason is to invite others into this story of God, for them to understand who Jesus is, what God has done for them, and that is our reason. Now, I I tell you that to tell you this. Hospitality is the means by which we do that. Hospitality is the means by which we show people who God is. And and I use the word hospitality. It's, It's in the Bible, okay? Now, hospitality is so misunderstood. I was looking up this week, exactly where does the word hospitality, where did it originate? Why do we use this word? It's a Latin word. The word hospitality is a Latin word, and it means this. It means a charitable institution to house and maintain the needy. It's, It's some place that houses and maintains someone who is needy. So, it's the word that we get the word hospital from. It's a place that houses and maintains the needy, right? That is where hospitality comes from. Now, I've spent my fair share in hospitals. And I will say this. Let me ask you, why do people go to hospitals? Is it because you're like, hey, I want to go play golf today. There's a lot of people up at the, go- at the hospital. Let me go up there and see if anybody plays golf. Hey, guys, anybody play? Is that why you go to hospital? Or, or maybe, hey, man, they got a great cafeteria at Murray Regional. They got, like, all kinds of stuff to choose from. Let's just go up. They got, it's, it's plenty of room for all of us to eat. Let's just go to the hospital, and let's have, let's have a meal together. No, you don't do that. Why? A hospital has a defined reason. A hospital has a defined reason. It's a place where anyone that's sick or hurting or injured, they can come to get healing. Now, we had this lady come into our office Wednesday. And she comes into the door Thursday. She comes into the door, and she just absolutely collapses. And she's, like, screaming, and she says she can't feel from her neck down to her feet. And she is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a scene, right? Who, where do you think we sent her? Now, do you think we said, hey, is it okay if we send you to the hospital? I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, no. It's somebody's sick. Somebody's hurting. Let's go to the hospital, right? And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter. Everyone is welcome. Like, that is a hospital. Like, come and be healed. That's why, you go. That's, that's why people rush to the hospital. It's for care and healing. So, yeah, you're going to see people with all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of baggage, all kinds of issues going on. Understand, that's a hospital. So when bi- the Bible talks about us being hospitable, Keep that in your mind. It's not just people that look just like you. Invite them over to your home. It's 
No, everybody, this is the place to find spiritual healing. Come, everyone. So showing love involves hospitality. It's not easy, it's not convenient, and it's costly, guys. It is. It means this. It means that we're willing. And I'm asking you right now, are you willing to open up your heart and your home to other people? Are you willing? I'm just being honest right now because this message is not for all of you out there. It's for me. Uh, God's been teaching me about hospitality for over a year now. And just it's, it's one of those things where the question that we all have to answer is if God says agape love is showing hospitality, are we willing? Are we willing? See, I can say all day long that I love my neighbor. Jesus says, again, what are the two basic commands that we all follow? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your... and love your neighbor as yourself. So if we love agape our neighbor, again, listen, agape love involves sacrifice and action. How often do you have people over to your home for the purpose of hospitality? See, do we really love others? Do we, do we, are we vulnerable, vulnerable enough to say, listen, you are welcome in my home? And the Bible says who we, if we do that to the least, to the least, we do it unto him. Guys, we need to be a church that thrives on come, come, be a part of this story. Be a part of this story. Now, one thing I noticed this week as I was studying hospitality is basically every single time you see the word hospitality in the Bible, you also see the word love, either in the same verse or a verse before or after. Every time. So God is showing, you want to see what agape love looks like, here's hospitality. We saw it in Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, right? Love, hospitality. Let me give you another one. 1 Peter 4, verse 8. 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Love and hospitality go together. One of the things we do on my Israel trip is we go to a place in the south that's a Bedouin, Bedouin place, okay? So Bedouin just means kind of wander, like people that nomads, like they're here one season and they're over here another season, so they don't have like a, a permanent home. So if you ever hear the, ner- the name Bedouin, that's what it is, okay? So one of the things we do is we go to a Bedouin tent in South Israel. And there we learn about hospitality. Because to them in their culture, it's just a natural thing. Like today, in, when I was in Jordan a few years ago, we went to this guy's house. It's this guy's place there. He had, it's, he had like some sheep and stuff, and it's just kind of, he lives in a tent. And the first thing he did was he came out, hey, and of course he speaks I don't even know what he spoke. He spoke something. And through a translator, he's talking to us. This guy's Muslim, but he's like, this is yours. Come on. Come here. What do, you, what do you have questions? Let me show you. Can I feed you? Can you have a drink? He was so nice. So nice. That is their culture. Now, you got to understand that part first. But here's what it says. It says in 1 Peter, it says, be hospitable, hospitable to one another without complaint. So we're in Israel at that Bedouin tent, and the Jewish guy is with us, okay? And we were learning about hospitality, and he just stops everything. And he said this. He said, guys, turn to 1 Peter 4. He knows, he knows his Bible. Even though he's Jewish, he knows the New Testament too. He said, turn to 1 Peter. I want you to see something. And he read this verse to us. And here's what he said. He said, if you are complaining about having people over, that's not hospitality. He said, if that's your heart, he said, that is not hospitality. Hospitality is without complaint. Why? The reason for hospitality, you got you to catch this. The mission of hospitality is not a to-do list. Like, well, God tells me I got to do it, so let's see. Well, that guy looks pretty bad. You want to come eat supper with me tonight? I, I've, done, I've done my duty. That's not hospitality. Hospitality is a heart issue where you say, I want you to come in so I can show you what Jesus looks like. I want to come alongside you, hear your burdens, pray with you. That's hospitality. It's a heart issue. So if in your mind you're thinking, ah, 
It's Friday night. This Friday, I'm supposed to invite somebody over. Let's see. Who could? That's not hospitality. So understand, agape love is a love that comes from your heart. And because of that, you're driven to want others to know Jesus. Okay, handout. Second one. This will be a, a quicker. Sorry, I know that's a long thing. Number two. Walking in love honors one another. This is Romans chapter 12. Okay, turn over to Romans chapter 12. Start with me in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. You see where it starts with love, ends with hospitality. And I've thought about doing this the entire sermon, but there's so much here. And I would tell you, this would be a great text for you to unpack this this week as you look at what is love. Because it says some pretty powerful things about if you have agape love, you're going to hold fast to what is good. You're going to serve the Lord. You're going to be prayerful in everything. And it's, it's all awesome. But what I want you to focus on is the heart in verse 10. My Bible says give preference to one another in honor, but there's a little number beside it because that's not the best translation. The, the literal translation is outdo one another in showing honor. So, so the job of us as believers, so what I want you to see is this. How do you know you have agape love? Number one, to the outside world, you show hospitality. You open up your hearts and your home to show hospitality. In here, do you know how you know you have agape love? You outdo one another in honoring one another. You understand we have an enemy that wants to make us stop following Jesus. And we're, we've got churches full of people that just sit there and listen to sermons. All That's great. But do you know what keeps people going? Is if they have other people encouraging them. Hey, you're doing a good job following Jesus. Keep it up. We're cheering for you. Keep doing it. That keeps you going. And the Bible says if you're full of agape love, you are going to outdo one another in showing honor. So I want to give just a time. What I'd like for us to do is once a month, once a quarter, something, have time where we can outdo one another in showing honor. This is not going to take, I I want, if somebody wants to outdo someone by showing honor for someone else in this room, I've got a mic. Now, let me give you an example. Okay, I want to keep these short. This is not your last chance to do it. We'll do just a few, okay? But for me, let me say this, okay? I could go around the room. (laughs) I could go around the room in here. And just talk about how much all of you mean to me. I mean, I, I could. But as I, as I was studying hospitality and I was thinking about people here, man, there's so many of you that are doing this well. But one person I definitely want to show honor to is Trev. Because I, I remember, man, when we first started at First Baptist, I mean, I didn't know Trev uh, very well. But what I've seen God do in his life and his heart over these last, what, 15 years since I've known him is is incredible to me. Like, Trev is one that when we talk about hospitality, how he goes with people not even knowing it, people not even knowing how much he puts into it, going to Buffalo Valley and sharing with them week after week after week after week after week after week. And I guarantee you that sometimes gets old. Like, man... Another Friday night, no, I can't do anything else. I've got, but at the same time, what I'm saying is we have an enemy that wants us to stop, wants us to stop doing those things, and you can start thinking things in your mind. So like Trev and Tommy would be another one that's not here. I mean, just talking to those two guys, they're seeing God move in incredible ways, but it's because they've opened up their heart to say, I know these people aren't just like me. You see that? I know these people don't have my story but I want to invite them into the story. I want to show them what Jesus looks like. So thank you. I mean, keep going, right? I mean, this is awesome. Like, I love when God's using our people to do amazing things. So is there just a couple of you, short statements of someone to honor in this room. Is this on?
Okay. Um, just because this is right in front of me, and I've noticed it several Sundays, but Ju- I've watched Julie and sometimes kids wrestle with little Wesley here so that Shane and Kristen can experience the message and, you know, just giving them a break so that they can really experience in the Lord. And, and sh- I know she wouldn't want any accolades for this, but I've watched it Sunday after Sunday, just watching her just occupy him for the time that we're in here. And I just think that is being very hospitable to Shane and Kristen. Anybody else? I have to honor my wife. Um, This is a hard season for us right now. Our days are long. Um, my days are long, her days are longer. Um, she, I I don't feel a whole lot. Um, I like to help a lot in practical ways, but she feels and takes the burdens of every single one of you on herself. Um, and she, she never gives up no matter how hard it is. Um, if you guys had any idea how much she prays for every single one of you guys and how much she takes your burden on as hers. Um, it's a lot. She deserves honor, and she she never wants to be seen for any of it. One more. Anybody else? You don't have to. I just know personally that when um, we had a need, when Ken was sick with COVID and not able to maintain yard maintenance, Randy Hankins stepped in and he came over and worked for hours <laughs> and completed all the tasks to do that for Ken because he knew that Ken was wishing he was able. And I just love how everybody here prays for us and is willing to um, lend a helping hand at any time. I think this should be a regular occurrence here, honestly. that We should have moments. We did this at Josh's house one time in the afternoon, and it was so special. We were sitting in a circle and just able to share how can we honor one another Man, that, that's showing agape love. That, that's honoring one another, showing agape love. That's exactly what Scripture teaches we should be doing. If, if we want the world to know we love one another, number one, we'll be involved in hospitality. Number two, we will show honor to one another. And then let's keep going. Last one. Walking in love looks out for one another. Walking in love looks out for one another. Turn to Philippians 2. Here's what it says. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation in love, okay, so we're talking about love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with the humility of mind, regard our, one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. So what does it look like in verse 2 when it says, have the same mind? Well, it goes on to explain that you're going to have a unity of spirit intent on one purpose. So if we're going to have agape love as a body, we have the same mind, the same spirit, but we are completely focused on one purpose, and that is exalting Jesus. That is agape love, where we all have one singular focus. It's not this focus over here. and the, No, it's Jesus. That's our focus. Our focus is him and what he wants from us. Now, it goes on to tell us what to be watchful of in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. So let's, let's break that down real quick. What is selfishness according to Scripture? We can always selfishness. Selfishness in this Greek word, it literally means to work for hire. Okay? So, so what it means is 
I'm going to work for myself today. I'm going to do what I, I'm just going to do what feels good today. I'm just going to, I'm going to just live my life today for me, myself, and I. When God says, no, you've been bought with a price. You're to follow me. You're to listen to my preferences, not just do what you want to do. So selfishness is me saying, you know what, I'm just going to do things my way. God has a specific plan. He's created each one of you. You don't have to believe that. It's true. He has created you for a purpose, for a mission. He's given you specific things, talents and gifts and abilities that is specifically designed for what he wants you to do. He has. Now, the question is, are you going to use those things for your kingdom and your purposes and your fun and your desires? Or are you going to say, God, today, I don't want to be selfish. God, you are my master. You're my savior. You're my king. I live under your kingdom, and I'm going to do things your way today. So that's the first thing Paul says. If we're going to be unity, have unity and have oneness in spirit, the first thing is, you know what? You've got to watch out for that selfish ambition where it's all about us. To walk daily with Christ means we check our interests at the door and follow him, okay? The second word there, empty conceit, okay? This is a state of pride because um, a state of pride which is without basis, okay? Meaning this, I'm prideful for no good reason. And, And here's why that's important. We've talked about the fruit of the Spirit. One of them is goodness, And we've said this, none of us are good. That's what the Bible says. You are not good in yourself, none of you. So if someone sees good in you, what are they seeing? They're seeing God. They're seeing him. So there is no conceit or pride when we realize when someone sees good in me, James 1 says that's coming straight from God. And so that, you have to keep that in the back of your, you have to be thinking about that. These are the two things that are going to make us not be unified and not show love, is being prideful, well, it's all from God anyway, or being selfish. Now, then he goes on, let's keep going in verse 3, do nothing without conceit, or excuse me, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but, so the flip side, With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. So this humility of mind. And here's what that means. So our job, if we're going to show agape love, is to completely be dependent on the Lord in everything. Riley's back there sleeping. Okay. I don't mean to wake her up. Sorry, I like to yell. Okay. Riley's back there sleeping. Can she feed herself? Can she clothe herself? Did she change her diaper by herself this morning? Because that would have been sweet if she did. No, Riley is completely, completely dependent on her parents for everything. That's the picture right here. Like, if you want to be unified, show agape love to one another, is to understand that I am completely 100% dependent on my heavenly father. I cannot do it without him. Cannot. Complete dependence. Lastly, look at verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Agape love looks out for others. My life, God gave me life, he gives me breath in my lungs right now, should not be lived for me. And your life shouldn't be lived for you. That's scripture. I mean, that's that's exactly what he's teaching all throughout scripture. So a, a question I ask often, and I usually fail, okay, is am I investing my time for me or for the Lord? Am I investing my resources for me or for the Lord? Am I investing um, my energy for me or for the Lord? Because it gives me a window of who am I living for, really? Like if everything I do, everything I earn, everything I make is all about my pleasure, if it's all about, okay, I just want to do what feels good to me, then guess what? I need to Check that interest. Am I really under the lordship of Christ? Like, is he really my king? He can be my savior, but is he my my lord? Lord means king. Is he my king? My flesh, I'm telling you, wants to do all of it for me. That's, That's what our flesh does. But God did not create me for me. He wanted me to depend on him. And here's the thing he did. If you get this, you'll understand 
what we're supposed to be about. God gave us a mission from Genesis till now. God gave us a mission. He said, I want you to show the world who I am. That's your job. And I want to use you, and I want to partner with you, and the way you do that is agape love. You show hospitality. You invite others into the story. And then when we're together, guess what? We encourage one another. Let's keep going. That's what this is. It's a celebration to encourage each other what God's doing. But we also have to make sure that we're truly one body. We check our interest at the door, and we look out for the interests of others. Do you have your eyes open on how you can meet needs to those around you? Do you have your eyes open to that? That's agape love. So, so this is how we're closing today. Walking in love, I want to give you just a quick recap, and I want you to think about how you're doing. Walking in love involves hospitality. My question to you that you need to wrestle with here in a minute as we pray, will you open your home, will you open your heart to be a spiritual hospital for those to experience spiritual healing and to know who Jesus is? And again, you can say yes. The question is, are you going to back it up? Because agape love involves action. So when are you going to invite others into your home? Number two, walking in love honors others. It may be, man, you were sitting here thinking, I'd love to honor this person right now. And, and, and I didn't come to you with a mic or you didn't raise your hand. Maybe that's what God's putting on your heart to do this week is to honor someone and tell them, man, I see God using you. I see the kingdom breaking out because you're following the Lord. And maybe that's what you need to do this week because that is agape love. Three, walking in love looks out for one another. Maybe you know somebody right now is hurting or there's a need in someone's life. Agape love looks out for one another, knowing that your resources were not given to you for you. That's what Sodom thought. Sodom thought, God, you gave me this oasis. This is awesome. And when there were needy in their midst, they didn't care for the needy. And God destroyed them. Agape love is looking out for others. So I don't know what God's calling you to do, but we're going to go into a time of prayer. And, and guys, if anybody needs prayer, come up. Let's, we have leaders that will pray with you. But this is our time to just wrestle with God and just make sure our hearts are clear when we leave. So pray with me. God, thank you so much that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to pay for our sins. God, that is incredible. God, I pray that you would help us be agape givers to the world. God, there are people all around us that don't know your love, haven't experienced your love, and I pray, God, that we would be hospitable. That doesn't accidentally happen, and it's not easy, and it costs. But God, convict our hearts in such a way that we will see them, invite them in, and love on them and show your love. God, I pray that you would help us, Father, to just honor one another, help encourage one another, and help each other keep going, God. There's so many in this room. There's so many in this room that I love dearly. Help us to express that to one another. And lastly, God, move us out of the way. May it be about others so that you will get all glory and all honor. Have your way in our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. A benediction. You ever thought about what is a benediction? See, I, I said benedictions every single service that I've ever been in for 18 years. In Methodist Church, that's how we finished every single worship service. I don't think anybody ever stopped to say, here, here, this is what a benediction is. A benediction is not just some little prayer we're saying. It's not some little ritual that, hey, let's just all get up, and this is our little verse, let's just do it. It's, it's a reality of what we're walking with, right? So the very first benediction in the Bible is what? Numbers chapter 6, the Aaronic blessing, right? The blessing of Aaron. God told Moses, Moses, tell Aaron that when you gather, I want you to tell the people something. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord put his countenance upon you and give you peace, all right? That's the, Aaron, that's, that's the blessing of Aaron. And so for years, listen, where were they at that moment? They're in the desert. And God's saying, I want you every time you're together to be reminded that I'm with you. And my face is shining upon you. And I'm going to be gracious to you. And don't seek shalom, peace from other things. I'm your peace. Come to me. And it's a statement of, listen, as you go, just don't know who you are. So as we say... 2 Corinthians 13, 14, I want you to understand, it's saying that as we leave those doors, we're going to walk out grace. Like God has given us grace, and we're going to give grace to others, and we're supposed to set our minds and our thoughts on that reality, our love. God has lavished us with love, and he wants us to be love givers to other people. And then lastly, fellowship, right? So as we say these things, It's a reminder of us setting our hearts and our minds as we leave those doors of who God calls us to be and that he is with us no matter what we face. So I want you to receive this morning these words, okay? Don't say them after me. I want you to listen to these words in your heart. Receive these words, and as we leave, let's leave with this thought in our mind. Ready? I'm not sure I am. You ready? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.